I couldn't go riding because my bike was broken and I was injured, but I could sit and play. And that's where I was like mimicking Slayer and mimicking early Metallica and Megadeth. And I had a passion for it. And I think at that point I thought, this is what I want to do with my life. Greetings, Legion, and welcome to episode 211 of Into the Necrosphere. 2023 is firmly in the rear view mirror, and for my first proper interview of 2024, I am speaking to none other than Derek Boyer of Suffocation. Uh, he was on the show to talk about their brand new record, Hymns from the Apocrypha, what it was like uh, replacing Frank Mullen, uh, an absolutely iconic vocalist uh, in the band, um, the response to the new record, we also touched on uh, some of his own personal experiences, his own personal journey from having a dream of playing in a band like Suffocation to actually finally making it a reality. It is an inspiring, energizing, really thoughtful conversation that is coming your way very shortly. But before we get to that, back on episode 199, I debuted one of Matt Brizzo's many projects, Conspiracy X. You guys loved it. And so therefore, I am very pleased to let you know that there's a brand new Conspiracy X single that is on Bandcamp right now. So for your listening pleasure, here it is. This is Conspiracy X with Torture. That was Torture by Conspiracy X. Uh, the song is available right now on Bandcamp. It features none other than Matt Prezzo, who seems to put out something great at least once a month. Uh, he'll be back on the podcast at some point this year, but in the meantime, check that track out on Bandcamp. Buy it if you like it. Support great independent music and let them know who sent you uh, when you do shell out those ducats. If you're new to the podcast, my friends, and you like what you have heard so far, then make sure you elbow drop the subscribe button on your platform of choice 
Keep leaving those comments, keep leaving those likes, and keep leaving those reviews on uh, Apple and Spotify in particular. Uh, and of course, make sure that you follow me on the socials. I'm on Instagram, Facebook, and X. Uh, you also can head over to the Into the Necrosphere Teespring store if you want to buy yourself a t-shirt or a hoodie or whatever else catches your fancy. Uh, and then, of course, you will be aware that I am a member of an elite cabal of podcasters putting out high-quality content from Monday to Sunday. We start your week with another installment of Horror Wolf 666 every Monday, hosted by the inimitable Brandon Legion. On a Tuesday, yours truly casts hexes and slaves poses on Into the Necrosphere. Every Wednesday, Sensei Mike Hill brings you uh, the longest-running podcast in our ranks, Everything Went Black. He returns every Thursday with my favorite show of the week, Necromaniacs, featuring his co-hosts, uh, Sheriff Mike Scondado and Professor Jeff Kashid. Um, on a Thursday and a Sunday, the great Carl Hikara brings you a journey into the dark, the weird, the arcane, and the esoteric. Uh, I fully expect that the nickname I have bestowed upon him, the Sinister Minister, is going to stick and become part of the popular vernacular. Um, and then, of course, uh, waiting in the shadows, ready to pounce when you least expect it, uh, Iblis Manifestations is hosted by Cheyenne of the band Trivax. Uh, once I am done with Derek Boyer, don't go anywhere because there is plenty more to come. We're going to give you uh, a quick synopsis of two great releases that came out this past weekend. Uh, and then is on to the the weekly news rant this week i've got some exciting announcements to make uh about the show um a couple of things that uh are coming up in the not too distant future that uh i think uh, potentially benefit the entire legion but equally means we may have uh, a couple of opportunities to bump into each other and have uh, have a few beers uh, if you're anywhere in my vicinity and of course i will be doing what i usually do on the news rant which is to round up the latest singles for judgment uh this week we are listening to new music by vincent crowley despondency uh we have got on tap uh, another single by the band farsat there's a fair few other things we're going to be listening to uh i also spoke a bit about uh, some recent comments by phil anselmo about band Pantera speculating about whether or not there's a new Pantera record possibly coming down the track or going to be announced at some point down the track and much much more that'll be coming your way very shortly uh, but first brace yourselves for one of my favorite conversations that I've had for at least the last six months this is Derek Boyer of Suffocation so we were just talking offline about how things have been going um, but I, I'll let's 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 kind of you know ease you into this uh, into this experience I saw on your Facebook page you've uh, you've been out having vacation up in the mountains um, enjoying the enjoying the good life you know what very fortunate um, have some family if you're referencing uh, the Denver denver yeah. trip my cousin lives up in the mountains and oh my goodness they're doing it right you know it's it's such a inspiration to see people like you were just saying the finer things you know either everything matters or nothing matters and uh you know they both work but uh you know you can get through life happy if hey none of this matters no big deal or hey man we need to be really on top of everything and uh, I like to lean toward everything matters, but sometimes none of this shit matters, you know? So uh, it's nice. Yeah, we're luckily over the uh, Christmas break, we usually take off time from touring to see our loved ones and stuff like that. So I was able to see my cousin who I don't get to see as much as I'd like. And uh, my wife and I went out to uh, uh, out in Colorado and it was just beautiful. It was beautiful. Yeah, yeah. And you're, I mean, uh, uh, and again, it's not, not, I'm not stalking you, but you mentioned it on your, sure. on your public Facebook page. I saw us your, your first uh, wedding anniversary on the, um, of, or year one wedding anniversary yeah. on the 23rd of December. Yeah. 24th. Um, we did it on Christmas 24th. Eve. 24th. Yeah. We did oh, it on awesome. Christmas Eve. Yeah. 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 Well, well congrat belated congratulations. Thank you very much. Um, it's been fun. It's been great. How did, uh, like, I mean, you guys are a pretty hard touring band, right? And I know you're, you're, you're three years older than, or actually two years older than me. Okay. Um, so, uh, you know, question, question for you is, you know, how does she deal with you being away from home? Like, how do you guys deal with the touring cycle? Luckily, um, you know, being away from home, you know, in the, in the breaks that you are. Luckily, she's a good friend of everybody in the band. And a lot of the time she'll travel with us. Um, I met her. And she was doing merchandise and so we stole her and she was selling merchandise for suffocation she's done a handful of tours like that um 
if we're doing somewhere weird where there's a lot of flights and uh it's too cost too costly to fly her everywhere we'll mm -hmm. use like the local person or whatever and she'll still fly in and and see us or you know she's very supportive she's a musician she's a technician she's in audio engineering she's she's in my wheelhouse so uh i'm very lucky that she understands obviously nobody wants to be together yet apart but um yeah. at the end of the day she rolls with it she's a good one and uh we use her when we can and if not we try to get her get her to pop in somewhere and if it's the us it's easy if it's europe it's easy latin america and asia australia and that stuff is a little bit harder but uh yeah still like to get her out as much as possible and and she's very supportive i'm, I'm fortunate that's awesome uh as i i've you know in in all of the time i've spoken to to people from bands i often go away and sort of reflect on the conversation you think you know with some of these dudes like you know guys that are you know in, in seriously hard touring bands like you know 200 dates a year or 150 dates a year or whatever i don't That's think hard. you know people that aren't in that from that world or don't live that life i don't actually think they fully appreciate the toll that that takes on you mentally, the toll that that takes on any kind of relationship that you're trying to maintain Physically, outside of mentally, yeah. all of it. Yeah, it's it's tough, you know. And uh, some are cut out for it, and some are not, you know, because some of the best players want to eat what they want to eat when they want to eat it. And being on the road, you don't often get that exact luxury. So I feel like, yeah, yeah, some are cut out for it, some are not, and. Uh, it's it's hard it's a lot harder than people think too because they see the the show and they go wow you live such a great life but they don't know about you know the finish your show get to your place get situated get to the lobby get to the airport fly land get to your spot get to sound check get back you know it's like every day there's a lot more work and strain on somebody physically mentally emotionally than than people think they just mm. see the show or the album and they go wow you guys got it made and and we do you know we're very fortunate to have the the luxuries we do but it's a lot harder than people think so what sort of touring touring schedule are you guys running for, for like for example for this album cycle uh right you know how many how many yeah. dates would you guys have you know roughly speaking and uh, booked for 2024 it's 150 200 shows a year that's Jesus. like if, if we're on an album cycle or a touring cycle, you know, like if we're locking into the studio and writing, we'll tour less that year. But um, as soon as the album drops, it's go, 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 go. You're out a month, you're home a month, you're out a month, you're home two months, you're out a month and a half, you're home three weeks, you know, like, so it's, it's, it's busy. You're, you're playing more than you're resting, you know, as far as uh home. Yeah. And do you guys deliberately try and schedule it that way so that you've got those, you know, at least that month break in between um, kind of, rather than, you know, it. just going constantly? You kind of need it. I mean, and we've done the constant stuff. Uh, I think we did like uh, U.S., Europe and Latin America back to back to back to back. I think we did like 100 shows in 125 days or something mm -hmm. like that. So it's like you're home a week, you're back out, you're home two weeks, you're back out. And uh, we enjoy it because we're, again, fortunate we work an hour a day. You know, like mm. you can go slave in a factory for eight hours a day, which I've done, and I'm not above it. But the idea that we're, we're lucky we enjoy what we do and the hours that we work, you know, physically on stage, you know, an hour a day is uh, we're, we're fortunate, you know, because we could be digging ditches in the snow you know for eight hours a day for you know similar money you know so yeah, yeah. <laughs> we're, we're, again it all comes back to we're very fortunate what is the um i mean what's the general mood like in suffocation at the moment because you I, from my observation you know you you guys must be on a real high like i think I remember when I spoke to, to to Terrence, you know, he had this quiet confidence about Ricky being in the band and, you know, what the new material would sound like with him in. But, I mean, I've been a fan of Suffocation since, you know, very early days. Um, you know, for me personally, you know, Frank Mullen has always been this towering 
figure of this, you know, this real like he you know he's he's one of the crew characters in death yeah. metal yeah and so to replace him you know you're talking about big you shoes know, to fill. Yeah, hundred percent. It's like you know, it. I, I would say it's on a par with Morbid Angel replacing David Vincent back in the day. Yeah, and um, you know, Steve Tucker jumped in and did a great job. Yeah. and the same thing. Ricky's doing a really good job. You know, we're we're pleased with his conviction. You know, like you get a lot of guys that are you know silly, and uh, you know, like we're 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 wacky when we're not on stage. We're fucking lunatics. But when it comes to rehearsals writing and performing it's dead serious there's no there's no room for jokes and stuff like that but uh so ricky ricky's a very devoted committed guy and uh he was great to work with in the studio great to work with writing and uh on stage he's a beast so for us yeah losing frank is is a, a tough take axel rose out of guns and roses you know what are you yeah gonna, yeah He's the figurehead. He's the voice. He's the face. He's the name. But uh, again, anytime we've ever lost a guy, you know, it's hard to lose a Mike Smith. If you lose a Mike Smith, you got to get a Dave Colross. You know, you got to get somebody that's that can do what the other guy did. And uh, Ricky's just awesome. I, I I can't complain. He he rips. He's invested into his equipment. He's committed to his show. He's committed in his writing, running everything past us. And hey, does this work for you guys? And he's a pro. He's a pro. Mm -hmm. So let's let's read because I want I want to I want to focus on that uh, in, in a little bit. But let's let's rewind a bit a bit just to you know kind of the the news breaking about Frank leaving. Like, how did you find out about it? Did he did he get you guys together in the band room? Like like talk me through how that happened. Frank's been trying to leave for ten years. <laughs> <laughs> he's he's like yeah um i don't want to eat that garbage i don't i don't want to wake up in some fucked up town you know and every town's fine but the idea is he likes to be comfort he likes mm -hmm. to live in his comfort and um can't blame him you know when when he said he wanted to you know i think it was pinnacle and he was like this is my last album and we were like, wow, fuck, man. And uh, we did Of the Dark Light. And we're like, come on, Frank, please. And when he did it, he was like, don't ask me again. And uh, it was one of those things that, you know, he just wants to be comfortable. He's got his beautiful home life and his wife and his home. And Frank's really got it set up. And uh, mm. we want we want everyone to do what makes them happy. You know, if Terrence turned around and said, hey, you guys, you know what? I just don't want to do it. We would respect that. Um so luckily we have a very good relationship with all the previous members uh down from everybody you know australia josh you know doug bones out in texas doug cerritos right here we see him a lot frank we see him a lot um smith we run into everybody we're all on good terms so you know when people leave a band it's for a reason and mm -hmm. we have to accept and support their decisions so right now we've got a great lineup and it seems like everybody's go 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 the record's doing good and uh i don't see us slowing down anytime right now musically i mean it, it definitely doesn't sound like it which again you're like i, I think you know you, you you talk about like great victories of of 2023 you know for me the the new suffocation album absolutely stands out as one because it's not just that it's it's not just that it's a great record or that it's a you know a competent death metal album i mean it is a it's an album that's, that i think ranks pretty highly in 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 the suffocation canon you've awesome. got a, a front man that's got you know presence that's on that's you know on a par with his predecessor yeah you know in Which in a in a feel. spot that is so that's so difficult to fill but um when when frank originally said you know this is this is the end for me like was there ever a point where the thought crossed your or terence's mind or was it ever under discussion that look you know maybe we're gonna maybe maybe that's where we where we draw a line under suffocation whether you yeah. guys go on to do something else or whatever the case may be but was that ever something that that was a was a possibility well, I mean, in 1998, at the Milwaukee Metal Fest, Suffocation bowed out of the industry, and I yeah. was there. 
we were out with Deeds of Flesh and Dying Fetus and everybody played that year, you know, Death and Suffocation were on the headlining stage and everybody dehumanized, Gorgasm, Deeds of Flesh, Dying Fetus, Internal Bleeding. I mean, everybody played that year. And uh, at the end of the night, when Suffocation was closing the show, when Frank said, hey, it saddens me to say this, but um, this is the last time you're going to see Suffocation, we all were like, oh, no way. Because, you know, from a fan perspective at that time, we were devastated. You know, we really wanted to see Suffocation continue their legacy. And five years later, when they got back together, they had pretty much all the original members and I was so excited to see them. And uh, I was doing the Vital Remains thing and Glenn Benton wasn't playing and singing. He was just singing. And I had just done Decrepit Birth with Tim Young and Tim Young got the gig with Vital and they asked, hey, does anyone know any bass players? So I got the call and I went and did the Vital thing with Dave Suzuki, Glenn Benton, Tim Young, Tony Lazaro and Suffocation same building five years later came back and mm -hmm. we were all so excited to see suffocation and that night they asked me if i would consider joining and it was like the most your favorite supermodel wants to marry you and she's rich you know like that was the the dumb yeah out. yeah so uh that was 20 years ago so um it's been a wild ride and the whole thing is if somebody wants to bow out, you have to honor, honor their, you know, honor their idea. And mm -hmm. so luckily right now, nobody has any, any vision of pulling it out, pulling, mm -hmm. pulling the plug now. So I think we'll, we'll keep ripping for a while longer. Just, just pausing on, uh, on Vital Remains for a second. I mean, you joined Vital Remains at a fucking wild time. Yeah, you, 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 you didn't play on any of the records, though, did you? No, it's a weird story because every band that I was working with, I was working my way up the ladder. They would say, "Hey, can you come do this tour?" And I learned the mm -hmm. material and would go do the tour. They would ask me to join the band, and then somehow the band would self destruct. So, like, I joined deeds of flesh and we did some successful stuff and i was gonna join the band and boom the band explodes then mm -hmm. a couple of months or a year later dying fetus has me come out to fill in and they go hey you know we'd we'd, we'd entertain you staying in the band you know would would you consider it and i'm like hell yeah i love dying fetus and boom the band explodes and the same kind of thing happened i went back and made decrepit birth got Tim Young and uh, the record deal with Unique Leader, did that record. And then uh, Tim wasn't going to stay in the band. They didn't have anybody that could play like Tim. And that band went away. Tim went to Vital and asked me to come and do it. And then that led me to suffocation. But it was strange that I would get in these bands. I thought the chemistry was great. We all played well. And the next thing you know, the band would self-destruct. Mm -hmm. And so it's one of those things that as soon as I landed the suffocation gig, it's been so solid. I mean, we've lost members and members have bowed out, but uh, the overall picture of suffocation is strong. It's running strong. So, Well, a lot of that seems to be... Um you know, that seems to be anchored by the, the relationship that you have with, with Terrence. So when I, when I had him on, yeah, and I can't remember whether this was actually on the episode or whether this was just when we spoke offline, because we spoke about 20 more minutes after the interview ended, but sure. uh, like, I really got a sense from him that the, the friendship and the, the, the brotherhood he's, he has with you, yeah. um, it, in many ways is kind of what, what, what's at the core of keeping the band together and, you know, why he, yeah. he you know, why he has such a passion for, for continuing uh, to do it. What was it like? Where, where, where did you, where did you meet him? You know, and Terrence was the hardest cookie to crack. Um, because, really? uh, yeah, it was interesting because, um, when the band reformed Guy Marche from Pyrexia, which was like one of my favorite sermon of mockery was like one of my favorite death metal albums of all time. When he went, to suffocation and he's an original member he wrote catatonia mm -hmm. and uh when the band reformed they didn't have doug cerrito they had guy and guy and i had talked about doing some stuff just through the internet you know talking about hey man i love pyrexia and i was 
playing in a band deprecated that was very pyrexia-esque and uh so when when i saw a guy playing for suffocation and he asked me to come on i was like wow and now i'm sitting low on the totem pole um you know you had smith and frank and guy and terrence and everybody was so cool and terrence was like kind of stonewall to me and uh it was so strange because after all this time like i'm his right hand man he's my right hand man where i'm second chair now i used to be the fifth chair you know i was yeah, the newest yeah. guy and then as these other guys peeled out i worked my way up and yeah he and i live in a home together we have the recording studio and the rehearsal studio and the the touring equipment storage and the merchandise everything is here in in this uh this headquarters and so yeah he and i just became like from the furthest apart to the closest what is it that you think you know what what is it that created that bond like what 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 is it i guess what what lit the spark with you guys this is the funniest part i did not smoke cigarettes when i joined suffocation yeah no one in suffocation smoked cigarettes except terrence terrence was a hard cookie to crack you know hard hard egg to crack or whatever and at rehearsals he would step out for a smoke and i thought man this is the only guy that's not like really embracing me. So I would step out and say, Hey, can I bomb a smoke from you? And so this little dumb thing now I've been smoking for 20 years, um, was the thing that kind of broke the ice. Cause I would go out and shoot the shit with him over a cigarette. And then over time, you know, we both smoke weed and this and that. And so we would get together and work on music and, somehow the bond the bond just grew and mm. now it's like right hand man you know that's fucking awesome like the the dynamic that um that that, that you guys have like what how has that evolved over the years because again like as you say you you're the two longest serving members of the band right now so yeah. you know i know terence writes the lion's share of the of the riffs but i know you contribute musically as well how yeah. how is that you know how's that creative dynamic evolved over the over the you know last 20 years of you being in the band well in the beginning i didn't really have a voice you know i didn't want to be the young the the lowest guy on the totem pole and try to throw my weight around mm -hmm. you know so i was always really quiet and reserved and with each album i got more of a voice and uh i would go work with him i'm being the ambitious one i would show up at his place you know get a case of beer and sit around and smoke and and talk about music and we just started collaborating and writing together and he has a funny story where i would you know come wake him up in the middle of the night like i got a riff you know and and he would laugh about it and be like do you remember your riff and i'm like nope <laughs> but uh you know we we got really close you know I would stay out at his place and uh i was the ambitious one trying to always show up and you know suffocation was my favorite band and so getting to work with him and the funny thing i told him when i was a kid i used to play guitar before i switched to bass back in uh 95 95 i switched to bass mm. and uh yeah next year it'll be 30 years of playing bass that's that's crazy but uh I used to have a dream, a reoccurring dream that I'd be sitting in a room with Terrence and we both had guitars and he'd be showing me something and he would say to me, you're not ready, kid. You're not ready, kid. And I would wake up and be inspired to try to get ready. And uh, eventually I switched to bass and metronome all day, every day and just doing my runs and getting my muscle memory and by the time that we became you know in the band together i had already had my chops and he never said you're not ready kid anymore you know it was in the dream but uh yeah it just it just evolved and being ambitious and him being like you said the lion share we started collaborating and then i started writing a, a lot of the lyrics um and it just it just worked out it just really just mm. all kind of naturally came together what made you switch to bass was it was it during the bass on uh suspended and tribulation on uh you know what? Or for from within? it is one of the better 
depths of depravity and suspended yeah. and tribulation those those songs and chris richards you know like super sick tone style yeah. everything about him playing and uh he and alex webster you know in the in the 90s were the the guys those were the two guys you know and now by now it's you know de giorgio and tony Choi and all those others a lot of really good players out there but um i think yeah it, it's hard it's hard to say because it it just evolved uh mm. i'm sorry I, I've, I've taken myself off track off the question no uh, no 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 go for it yeah, I, was, I was about to say that's all that's the whole point of the podcast <laughs> going yeah, yeah, as off yeah. track as you want get a little loose and <laughs> yeah but um yeah i mean because there's i mean i guess there are a fair few folks that'll switch from from guitar to bass but i feel there's oh, a yeah, there's, there a, there's a dearth there's, of there's, decent bass players in the in, in in the world there's tons of good guitarists i'm back on track i'm back on track so i was a guitar player in a band and yeah. uh we were playing a party a keg party and uh cops show up break the party up and some some tall dude with long dark hair comes up and says hey uh i'm new in town you guys are awesome can i join your band and at the time i was like way into james murphy and all the arpeggios and the sweeps and i couldn't do them and i said to the guy can you arpeggio can you sweep and he goes yeah top to bottom no problem and we're like yeah right and this guy was a guitar institute student you know musicians institute and uh i think i was 16 and he was 18 or uh yeah i was 18 and he was 20 he was a couple years older than me and he joined my band and as soon as he started writing i couldn't i didn't have the technique that he had and uh he tricked me this is how i got into playing bass and he was like, you know, hey, you know, our bass player, you know, he doesn't really show up. He doesn't really care about his gear. And I was super ambitious, but I was self-taught. I had a lot of bad techniques. I wasn't using my pinky. My hand was all over the place, you know, and he had really good form and ergonomically correct playing. And one day he takes us down to Guitar Center and he grabs a sick bass, plugs it into a sick bass rig, bang, bang, bang. He goes, man, doesn't that sound a lot better than our bass player, you know, tone and equipment? And I go, hell yeah, it does. And he goes, all right, we'll take it. And that guy bought on a credit card $3,500 worth of amps, Jesus. cables, and bases and handed it to me. Yeah. And, and told me one of two things is going to happen if I stick with the guitar. Um, I'll either realize... I have years of bad habits and I'll quit or it's going to take a decade to correct all of my bad techniques into efficient techniques. And he said, or you can be the bass player of our band. And I went, holy shit. I had to pay the monthly credit card bill that he put it all on and I was paying paying the credit card 75 bucks a month or whatever it was and eventually i bought the stuff off of him uh paid it all off and that was that was back in 95. can so you remember was, what kind of what what type of bass it was uh it was a sound gear ibanez and it was a middle of the road bass i think like an 800 series and probably about an 800 bass but the bass rig was a uh was it Sun Valley or Simi Valley? Sun Valley uh, SWR, mm. the early really sick stuff, and had the SM nine hundred and the Goliath four tens, and then uh, I went through so many different configurations with the triads and the Big Ben and the six ten, the the Goliath Junior and or uh, Goliath Senior, whatever the hell before the Mega Goliath, and wild wild ride because I had no intention of switching but mm -hmm. when i could lose this problem and start doing this from scratch with the metronome start doing my runs using all of my fingers ergonomically positioned before you knew it you know and he made a joke he goes within six months you'll be on stage playing bass and sure enough in six months i had already actually joined disgorge ricky ricky's old band when he played yeah, drums yeah. 
and I was playing on stage, playing bass in Disgorge, which was like one of my other favorite bands. I'm so lucky I played in my favorite bands, Disgorge, Deeds of Flesh, Dying Fetus, and now Suffocation. So too fortunate, very fortunate. So that, uh, like, like the, the, in the lead up to that happening, like the six months running up to that, like describe the amount of work and the amount of effort that it took from your side to be able to successfully make that transition. Like how often were you practicing every single day? What kind of stuff I, were you doing to, to, was, to get, especially to train your hands to do as, yeah, to do as well? I was, it's quite different. I was doing six to eight hours a day. And uh, the cool thing was he bought me a metronome and uh, it was the wind up type. So if you wound the metronome all the way up and you let it go through the motions, when it died, you had to rewind it. You had to wind it back up. So I would wind that thing like six to eight times a day. Mm. And every single day, I didn't take any days off. I mean, it was funny because my friends would come to the apartment and my bass would be laying in the bed. And they're like, hey, there's your old lady. You know, like you spend more time with that yeah. than, than the girls, you know, and and at the time it was true. You know, I was just playing and playing. I was so ambitious and uh, just kind of worked my way up through the ranks all the way up to to my favorite position, which is suffocation. Mm -hmm. What what music were you playing to initially? Like what songs were you playing to? Like how were you, you know, I would assume you didn't, you know, immediately go, all right, I'm going to, you know, work my way through purification through violence as, you know, my first go around. No, you know, and I had to learn that song when I joined, when I joined uh, Fetus. But uh, at the time it was more muscle memory. You know, mm -hmm. let's uh, do every time signature, uh, note, note value and time signature for for hours you know so dun 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 and by now i can go but at the time it was more about building the muscle memory i wasn't really learning songs per se if i thought and what i was taught by that guitar institute guy um what I was taught was if if I build the muscle memory and understand the note values and time signatures, if I had that down, I can play any song. Mm. If you just want to jump into a song, but you don't have those chops, it's going to be difficult. So in his theory was get really good at the instrument, learn top to bottom notes, values, signatures, and then when it comes time to learn a song or write a song, you have the ability. Up up until that point, was that the only kind of instruction or training that you that you received? Were you were you self taught otherwise? Uh, yeah, I mean, literally, I picked up guitar because I liked Slayer, and I was mm. just ripping and just trying to get it out. And I bought the tablature books and stuff. And right around that time. I was way into Slayer. I got Death Human, Sepultura mm -hmm. Arise, Effigy of the Forgotten. And all of a sudden it was like, wow, they are doing the same note values and time signatures very well. And I thought, well, I can fake it and, and not necessarily know the note, but the signature, you know, okay, they're playing eighth notes. Da 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 da. Okay, they're gonna go into sixteen. So if I could fake my way through a song and get the stamina, by the time it was time to either join a band or write my own song, I would have the ability. So I mean, it was. If it wasn't for that guy, I would have probably quit or just been in a mediocre band faking my way through it but he kind of pointed me in the direction of man if you if you get these chops down if you get these motor motor skills muscle memory you can do anything you want and i kind of went with that theory and i learned all the notes uh all the note values and the problem is i learned rhythmic theory being a mm. bass player i didn't learn melodic theory so if someone's like play a scale in the key of e 
I'm not necessarily just going to pull that out. But if they say, hey, we're going to play eighth note triplet into 16th note with a with a tempo change, I could rhythmically understand the language. But when it came to the melodic part of it, I never really got there. And Terrence has a really good melodic theory in his mind. So working off of him, I would bring more chromatic and uh, aggressive values and then he would put the melodies into what i was doing so we worked really well together and uh it all just kind of came together that's yeah. the great thing about his style and just generally suffocation sound is that <clears throat> you know you think about like we you, you you've been talking about a couple of different um different flavors of death metal like you know when you talk about death you talk about dying fetus like you've got these different stuff but I think suffocation does a really good job of almost bringing you the best of all worlds with, you know, the vast majority of albums that the band has put out, like, because you have these moments of melody and then, you know, the band kind of pulls back and it's violence, carnage, chaos. Then it's, you know, breakdown. So, you know, you touched on pyrexia, you know, even if we're like, if we take um, purification through violence, that first song, blunt, blunt force trauma, like that, that impact when you hear that just because of that groove. Amazing. Yep. Um, you know, you, but but I think suffocation brings you an awful lot of that. Not to mention the fact that you know when we talk about uh, purification through violence, I, th I think it's fair to say I've not spoken to John Gallagher before. He, he would rad. have to surely cite suffocation as a massive influence on on dying fetus. When I was working with with John and, and the fetus guys, you know, they said that suffocation was kind of their benchmark. And I mean, don't quote me on it, but it, I remember that fetus and suffocation were kind of in the same realm. They were doing the blasts, the grinds, the grooves, the breakdowns, the psychs. And uh, they kind of had a very, they had a very similar feel and vibe to each other. So I would say, yeah, they, they both kind of are in the same realm. Yeah, no, abs abs absolutely. And I, I mean, I remember hearing Blunt Force Trauma in particular. That's just like, uh, you know, Brutal. if I think about like the top five, six songs that made a big impression on me, yeah. hearing Amazing. that song for the first time, you I was into a really brutal death metal and stuff like that. But when you hear that, it's like, holy fuck. It's kind this of is a step up. Like, yeah, exactly. Yeah, I, like, I, I, I have not heard before. And they're playing so good right now. You know, I was just saying it in another interview. Every every band that's been around for a minute, they're playing so good. Everybody is doing yeah. such a good job of being tight, being creative, and uh, it's a it's a great era for death metal, in my opinion. Oh, with, without a doubt. I mean, if you you know if you think about twenty twenty three as a, like a nominal year for 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 death metal, to think that in a single weekend, uh, Dying Fetus, Cryptopsy, and Cannibal Corpse released records, you know, and yeah. all of them like elite tier albums. Yeah, you guys really released a, an elite tier record. Incantation put out an incredible record. You know, yeah. and that's like the the old the, that's the old guard. You know, then you start talking yeah. about a lot of the new bands. You know, Night there's Bear a lot of great something new bands. Yeah, and incredible. Yeah, hundred percent. There's a band called Ruin Lust. Um, you know, they put out a phenomenal album. So there's there's so many there's so much exciting stuff happening in death metal right now. But just a final question sure. on Dying Fetus. And I asked this because I was having a conversation similar along similar veins with somebody uh, the other day. Are you surprised at how popular that band became? Because if I had to ever pin like wider acceptance or wider popularity on a band out of all of the ones we mentioned and more, you know, whether it's yeah. Morbid Angel, Deerside, whatever the case may be, then I would have never in a million years said, you know, who's going to be massive? The band that just, uh, you know, yeah. pounded my brain in with a song called Skull Fucked. Yeah, and Kill Your Mother, Rape Your Dog, you know. Like <laughs> yeah, I, there you go. I think, uh, I think Dying Fetus hit on a very good uh, note when it came to, it was, it was abrasive. You know, they were talking about shocking subjects, you know, and, you know, with the rape and the, skull fuck and you know with my weed i smoke every day if i'm not high the hate will escape you know like they, they were they were <laughs> yeah. touching they were touching on stuff that a lot of people could relate to and it was also abrasive 
you know it was yeah. it was it was harsh and i think a lot of the other bands that play really well didn't have that shock you know cannibal corpse album covers very shocking you know so that did a lot for them dying fetus's lyrical content and their their overall badassness you know mm. fetus is one of those really sick bands and i think they shock a lot of people and uh another one i have to mention that's doing super super good is a uh, of a new one lorna shore for for us we're like man this this young new band is is pushing a level that is great we're so fortunate that the young bands are doing good you know because if everybody's just copying deicide and yeah. you know you get a lot of repeating you know themes that's cool but for you know the fetus shock value and the lorna shore edginess catchiness and uh popularity it's it's a great thing you know like a bunch of years back it was slipknot was doing a lot for metal you know metalocalypse doing a lot for metal now it's Lorna Shore, Dying Fetus doing a lot for, for metal. You know, they're getting popularity in it's helping all death metal. Yeah, yeah. Have you checked out uh, Werewolves out of Australia? I don't know it. No. And that's the thing. I, I, I used to be so ambitious to go find good new death metal. And I yeah. hate to think we're so busy with our 150, 200 shows a year and writing and resting between tours that i'm not ambitious enough to to go find good new death metal and it's out there there's a lot of it that's oh, out no, there's, there's 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 plenty out there i'm i'm particularly partial to werewolves it's it's I'm kind of got a out. thank you that's yeah it's I got like a whiff of, of black metal to it the guys are a bit older right. than like our age but it's it's hard as shit and and it's got that same abrasive go fuck yourself attitude that dying fetus says gotta have it gotta have it you gotta have that shock and that you know and we were just saying something else you know it's like uh if you got your gore death metal and you got your satanic death metal um you know and suffocation is kind of going down the middle we're not blood broken bones and we're not satan 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 but the act of killing is evil so mm. You know, you can still psychologically twist the listener and they they get that same shock value because murder and death is is evil, you know, but you're not having to say Satan, Satan, Satan to be evil. And, you know, you don't have to say blood, 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 yeah. because if you're murdering someone, it's going to be bloody, <laughs> you know, unless yeah, 100%. you, unless well, it's you like just choke them. <laughs> it's like saying okay what's what's more what's what's a more frightening movie silence of the lambs or the, uh, a nightmare on elm street um you know silence of the lambs is far more is far more realistic far more far more, far more gritty in my view you know yeah, it deals with something that, that actually for a lot of people it. yeah and then there's a, a gore yeah 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 but uh, you know for, for a lot of people something like silence of the lambs hits far closer to home and i think again what i've always appreciated about um suffocation lyrics um you know and I, the ones that i remember the most are the ones from the the, the earlier days but there's like a there is the, it's it there's always been an intelligence to suffocation lyrics like a th yeah. there's like and when i say intelligence maybe like maybe the a better word even is like there's a thoughtfulness to it Correct. you know if i think about something like um you know the invoking I mean, the invoking oh, yeah. is basically like you know a right to self defense kind of thing, yeah. which, which I yeah. think is fucking brilliant, and I yeah. think it is especially relevant in our day and age. But I mean, like I remember hearing that in amidst all the satanic stuff, the fantasy stuff, and that was what stood out to me. Like there was something exactly. much more poignant about hearing those lyrics, Frank singing those lyrics, than there is about hearing something about the devil. Blood, 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 Satan, yeah. Satan, Satan, or send them on a psychological twist you know yeah no 100 percent. you mentioned earlier it was slayer that got you playing guitar like what was the slayer album oh man i think uh 
I think the first thing I heard was uh, South of Heaven. Then I went Reign of Blood. And then, uh, you know, Seasons in the Abyss. Uh, I think that got me. And then all of a sudden, somebody said, oh, you think Slayer's nasty? And I go, fuck yeah. And they said, what about Napalm Death? And, you know, I got Harmony Corruption and it was a wrap. I was like, holy shit, this is fucking sick. And that's where it turned into everything. Gore Guts, Deicide, Obituary, Malevolent Creation. And it just, it just spawned. I have a CD collection of a few hundred brutal, aggressive death metal band CDs that I'll never get rid of. They're just so good. And yeah. I mean, I know you can go get them on YouTube, but having the physical copy and reading the thanks list and seeing the lyrics and their band photo, there's something about it that that era was just, you couldn't fuck with it. You know, it was, it I was think that's very unique to, to, to our generation though, because, you know, I, again, I remember that, uh, you know, I remember how you would treasure those things, you know, you know I remember getting, getting a new CD and, and just how much it meant to me, you know, it again, did. let's, let's take, let's take Pierce from within. I remember pouring over the lyrics, you know, and you're Absolutely. listening to every single song, like listening to the lyrics, which is why I still remember, you know, a lyric, like, you know, we will soon be punished for what we have done. You know, all of that stuff. I remember because I, you know, I, I would, I would go over it so often. Um, Love you know, as, as a youngster. Love and then you mentioned the, the, the thank you list. The thank you list was how we discovered bands. You know, yeah. it's not like oh, there was a, a, an, an internet for you to go check out, you know, who should yeah. I listen to? You check out who's in the thanks list. Well, fuck yeah, this band. I don't know be quite cool. if you picked up on the thanks list on hymns. We mention every fucking band because the young kids that actually buy the CD, which is not maybe as many as the old guys, if they read the thanks list and the bands that we, you know, contribute or, or, or the bands that we appreciate and know that our band thanks list is like a hundred. Like we, we list every single band that we've ever worked with or we liked. And mm -hmm. I think that would be great. Like you just said, to pick up, if the younger generation reads that, they're going to go, oh, my God, who's internal bleeding? Holy shit. Who's Gorgasm? Mm. What about Dehumanized? Pyrexia. They're going to see all these bands. And if they check them out, they're 99 percent of them are going to be brutal. The kids are yeah. going to get a they're going to get a treat. Just as a just as a side shout out, I, I've I've got to say this because you've mentioned Gorgasm a couple of times. Love I him. think that uh, Damien is one oh, of yeah. the most underrated frontmen in in death metal by far. He's, like he, like now he's doing he's doing Broken Hope now, right? Well, yeah. So I've seen him. I was I was about to say that's where I've really seen him most. So you know, I've seen him with Broken Hope three times. Um, the last two times I saw it, like. They played the Underworld with Cattle Decapitation, which was a great show for them. And then the next time they they played, they played at a fucking shithole. Uh, I think called the New Cross Inn, and it was a. Uh, I actually said I, I spoke to Jeremy because I'm, I'm friends with him afterwards, and I said, "Dude, I feel so bad for you guys because Jeremy's that was a Brad. phenomenal show, first of all. But Black that was Brad. a show that like hundreds of people should have seen because it was one of the most intense." tight aggressive death metal shows i've ever seen and damien was Bro, so no, fucking sick. good he's so sick man he's got a conviction in the same way of frank yes. and ricky that yeah. just there's, there's a commitment to their performance that yeah you know a lot of the other bands need they need that that conviction you know well that's the thing they treat it as a performance which is which is the difference right i i've always said i there's nothing that i hate more than a front man that comes on stage doesn't engage the audience doesn't um you know you don't have to be you know somebody who's going to be you don't have to be james hetfield in 1990 you know just talking shit to the which which i love but talking yeah, shit to the audience for like five minutes on end like that's frank you, you, <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah oh dude <laughs> So I remember, I remember the first ever suffocation show that I saw with Frank, and it was, I, I've, I, it's like there was a real sense of of danger and menace in the air. But it's because he comes on stage, and he he just stared at the crowd for like two oh, or yeah. three minutes. You know, yeah, the music Frank, is like starting. Yeah. You know, and then and then he starts his vocals, and it's just like Brutal. you you feel like at any point someone somewhere in the audience is about to get fucked up. 
That's like, right. Two ways about That's it. That's right. Yeah. One time there was uh, someone acting out in the crowd and Frank was like, stop the band. Get that motherfucker. Get that motherfucker. And they rousted some dude up and it, it was amazing. You know, like if you can command the crowd like that, that yeah. is special. Yeah, yeah. Well, see, I think again, I think Damien is somebody that has he's got that quality because he, I mean, he's firstly amazing. he looks he looks the part, which to me is very important. You know, I I I like I like front men that are you know muscled up and look fucking yeah. mean when they come on stage. Yeah. Um, but uh, yeah, he looks uh, yeah he, he looks the part. He sounds the part. I mean, you know, the, with the greatest of respect to his predecessor, you know, who also was a character in his own right. But Damien does such a fantastic job of those, uh, he's of great. those old songs. He's great. We love him as a human and as a fantastic frontman. Um. Anyway, just just uh, we, we we kind of got off track there. I was going to ask you. You you were talking about like you know getting into the music, and you sound like you were very. Like if I read between the lines of what you said so far about you know how you played with different bands, got to play in suffocation, there was a very kind of single-minded determination from from your end that you were going to be a musician, unless I'm misreading you. No, that's so where it. did that where did that happen? Like when at at what point what tipped you to make that decision that I think, being a musician was going to be your calling in life? I think um, well, my father was a classically trained pianist, so as a child. I was in a little bassinet under a nine foot concert grand piano and he was Rachmaninoff. So in my mind, I got melody and, and rhythm at a very young age. And then I was pushed into uh, aggressive sports, motocross, surfing, snowboarding. I got, I got in being in, from California originally. And I got injured. And when I was injured, I was laid up in a hospital and my bike was broken. My dirt bike was was fucked up. I was up. about to say, how did you how did you get injured? Uh I don't even remember what it was. Um it was it was an incident, uh a, co a collision. A collision. Uh I ended up getting on into a, it. on a dirt bike dirt bike into a like a quad or a dirt bike into a three-wheeler or something and while i was laid up um i was listening to a lot of slayer and uh someone that i knew offered to trade me a jackson guitar a marshall half stack a bunch of remote control cars <laughs> what a random thing for my broken dirt bike mm. and i thought to myself can I go pro racing motocross? Because I was racing, but I was mm. getting third, getting third and fourth. You know, I wasn't ever finishing first. And uh, I thought, can I go pro doing something? And I had the passion. I was listening to the aggressive music. Somebody offered to trade me my broken bike for a bunch of metal guitars and amps and stuff like that so i took it and while i was on the mend from a chipped hip and a ruptured pancreas and all this Jesus other Christ. so it was a, it was a fucking serious um yeah. serious accident yeah. i was life flighted in a helicopter to a hospital and uh and, and how I, old sorry and sorry i keep interrupting you but how no, old were no, you at the time i think i was probably 14 13 or 14 yeah. when I got in the bad accident. And when I traded the stuff, I couldn't go riding because my bike was broken and I was injured, but I could sit and play. And that's where I was like mimicking Slayer and mimicking early Metallica and Megadeth. And I had a passion for it. And I think at that point I thought, this is what I want to do with my life. And I mean, mm -hmm. I was young. And like I said, I got switched over to bass when uh, in 95. And at that point, I knew I was not going to take no for an answer. I was going to do whatever it took. And when I was in decrepit birth, I couldn't buy myself a cup of coffee. I was sleeping on the floor of my friend's mother's trailer park. And I was still committed that I'm going to make this. I'm going to do this. 
and I just worked my way through the ranks. And the next thing you know, this band is trying to hire me and this band I love is trying to hire me. And so I just kind of worked my way up the ranks and landed 20 years ago, my dream gig. So it just kind of, it all just kind of happened. How long were you, how long were you living in that kind of, in those sorts of circumstances for? Jeez, it was probably a good year of struggling. Mm -hmm. And we were looking for, if, if, if a guy could play good, he wasn't interested. If a guy mm -hmm. was interested, he couldn't play good. Mm -hmm. And so there was this thing, like you could get this guy, Hey, I want to join your band, but he couldn't play. Mm. And then you'd get the guy that could play really good, but he goes, nah, I'm just not really into it. And so it took a long time to meet the right people and uh, conviction, conviction, you know, being committed to I'm going to do this. And I just told myself, I'm not going to take no for an answer. I'm going to do this until until something happens. And God forbid, if it never took off. I don't know where I'd be. So I just, I stuck with it and it was hard, you know, when your tires are bald and you can't buy new tires and you can't even buy yourself a cup of coffee and you're sleeping on a floor of a trailer park, but you still have that commitment. This is going to work. This is going to work. This is going to work. And eventually, you know, with that conviction, it, it ended up coming together. What what kept you so resilient? Like what 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 kept the commitment? I guess the con what what kept the conviction intact? Because I think that's always to me that's always one of the most fascinating things when you listen to somebody who's had that determination about what they were going to do. You know whether it's you know you 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 are about guys that you know become UFC fighters, UFC superstars, and you know the, the dude is you know out working in Starbucks and training you know from fucking you know ten at night until three in the morning and then doing it again. But there's yeah. That 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 struggle to to achieve what in your mind is you 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 define as success. Like what what kept you on the road during the toughest times? I just I just knew somehow it was going to work out, and I just I wasn't going to quit, you know. And I think it it also came down to um, my mother telling me, see, I wanted to drop out of high school, and I mm. wanted to go surf and smoke pot, and my mother cried. And she said to me, I was, I was in my senior year. And she said to me, if you went this far and give up at the fucking last minute, you will never, ever finish anything. And then it hit me like a ton of bricks. Cause I was like, fuck this, fuck school. I don't care about what year fucking Johnny Appleseed did. I don't, I didn't care about school and I knew I was smart, but I didn't care about the subject. And I think when she said to me, if I drop out at the 11th hour, I'll never finish anything. And so I thought to myself, I've got all this effort into playing music and I'm getting my chops and I'm making connections if I give up now, I'll, I'll never be anything. And mm -hmm. uh, I think it just kind of turned into something subconsciously that I said, I'm going to do this. I'm not going to give up. I've worked so hard. I feel like I'm good. I got to just get with the right people. And, you know, being in the right place at the right time is really a big thing. You know, if, if you sit at home and you practice and practice and practice, but you don't go out and mingle at the shows, how the hell are you ever going to meet the right people? So putting mm -hmm. yourself out there was a big thing for me. I was always going to the shows, always meeting people, having demo cassettes. <laughs> That's dating us, you know, having a cassette of your demo. And uh, eventually you just said, I'm going to do this. And mm -hmm. uh, I never thought in a million years it would make it this far. And I'm so mm -hmm. proud and humble that we're still able to do this and people like what we do. And at now it's like my level of ability is much further than I thought it would ever be. So I'm just grateful. 
So, you know, we bring it full circle because I know we're, we're coming up to an hour. Um, you, you kind of spoke about your own journey. It must be extra special then to be in a band whose journey has been like suffocations where, you know, there must surely have been a sense from you guys, at least of some degree of hesitance, not, maybe, maybe because maybe skepticism is, is too strong a word, but, but hesitance from fans to go, okay, how are they going to sound without, uh, without Frank, without like sure. you know this this linchpin in the band, and then you drop yeah. a record like hymns from hymns from the apocrypha, and uniformly I didn't see a single bad word said about about that record. As soon as the first single dropped, every single person that I know, every single person on my socials, every everybody, any, anyone who's anyone went, holy fuck, this is incredible. Yeah, you know what? We felt like we were a, a unit. Uh, everybody got along. Everybody um appreciated each other's skill and uh there was no ego you know so we just kind of just pushed for it and we said you know what it's gonna work and if it doesn't work if someone doesn't like it they can fuck off because we like it we think it's good most people we think will also think it's good but at the end of the day if they don't like it if if it's no frank no suffocation go ahead Go mm -hmm. go away because the new people will like it because we like it, you know. So it was just determination. Well, brother, I really appreciate your time. Uh, that was a, a, a fantastic conversation, and hopefully, you know, something that that I mean, I, I I love when I have these kinds of chats because it's always, you know, it's 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 inspiring to hear that sort of thing. And, and you know, hell yeah, I'm Thank sure you. some somewhere. There's a kid listening to this, what you know, wanting to do, you know, wanting to forge his own path in music. I did smile when you were talking about the metronome because my mom was a piano teacher, nice. so she was she was a classically trained pianist as well, taught piano all of her life. Nice. So, so just to, just out of curiosity, because I find as I've grown older, I I I mean, obviously, you know, heavy stuff is is my main you know my main forte when it comes to music, but yeah. I do find myself attracted to quite a lot of music with. You know, piano, more melodic stuff. Love it. Um, and I and I've wondered sometimes, like, is that like my mo like my younger years listening to my mom playing the piano? So is that that coming through? I think um, so. Have you found the same thing is happening as you? Yeah, a hundred percent. You know, classical violin and piano and flutes and you know they're wonderful instruments and you know it it brings an emotion. You know, mm -hmm. someone said something along the lines of. If you can, if you can invoke, if you can, if you can make someone mentally stimulated and emotionally felt, I'm, I'm saying this wrong, but if you can get someone's emotion and mental stimulation out of your music, then, then you've done it right. You know, so you got to get those those two elements. And I think classical absolutely makes you think and gives you an emotion. So I think I, I, I would say the most critical lesson I ever learned about music was, was was actually from my mom. And it was one specific. Uh, I can't remember how old I was, probably like 10, 11 years old. There was a girl that she'd been teaching and she was going to go and play uh, her grade eight exam. And I was sitting in the like outside the examination hall with my mom, and I said, "How do you think she's going to do?" Um, and she said, "She's not going to pass." And I was like, "You know, how come?" And I said, uh, "And I, I said to her, like, I can hear what she's playing. You know, it, it sounds sounds fine. It sounds like she can play." I said to her, "I think exactly. something to the effect of, exactly. I said it, it sounds like she's playing the songs correctly." My mom said, "It doesn't matter." It says like you can Emotion. play a song correctly. But if you're not able to play with feeling, correct, you you, you may as well not bother. And it was the yeah. the most most critical thing. Like it, it stuck with me all of my life. And yeah. again, I think it's 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 what's informed so much of my taste later on in my life. Because yeah. I think if you if if that's something that's in your in the back of your mind subconsciously, you almost train yourself to listen out for that in bands that you that you're into. Yeah, I agree a hundred percent. I agree a hundred percent. But um, brother, I'm going to let you go. Thank you so much. I just want to say one quick thing to you offline. Um, we're going to say goodbye to everybody who's listening. But um, yeah, I'll, yes, uh, we'll I'll see you guys. Hopefully, we we'll see you guys out there.
Off the album Hymns from the Apocrypha, you just heard Delusions of Mortality, uh, and you heard a rip-roaring conversation between myself and Derek Boyer, bassist for Suffocation. Uh, that was so much fun. Um, just great to not only learn, you know, or kind of get a feel for the inner workings of what it was like when Frank left the band, you know, Ricky coming in, um, but uh, just, you know, listening to Derek's story, uh, you know, I just, I just absolutely loved it. Uh, I hope you guys enjoyed that as well. I know I've been, I've been talking this episode up for a while, but, um, you know, it was just one of those when, when I was done, I was absolutely buzzing. Um, and uh, yeah, I, I'm hoping that I'll be getting around to seeing Suffocation when they play in the UK. I think they're going to be uh, just up the road from me on the 26th of February. So uh, I'll, I'll say in the next couple of weeks if I'm definitely going there. And if I do, then hopefully I get to see a couple of you guys uh, around the way. But thank you to Derek for coming on the podcast. Make sure you check out for Hymns from the Apocrypha if you haven't done yet. It's available on Nuclear Blast Records. Uh, and thank you very much to Claire over at Nuclear Blast for or, uh, getting this set up for me. Um, I mentioned at the start of the show that I wanted to talk about two new releases that came out this past weekend. The first one, uh, Necro Wretch. They've put out Swords of Dajel. Uh, out on Season of Mist Underground Activists. Um, we have uh, listened to at least one song by Necro Wretch on the News Rant. Um, I loved it then. It is very much old school death metal with uh, you know a smattering of black metal and some real French flair. And for those of you guys that uh, if if the if the phrase French flair in the context of black or death metal makes sense to you, then you're going to know exactly what I'm talking about when it comes to this band. Eight tracks of just riff heavy nastiness, um, you know, no compromise. It's just fucking brutal from bell to bell. I absolutely love it. Uh, it is 37 minutes of sheer brilliance. Uh, from 37 minutes of brilliance to 27 minutes of brilliance, the new Obsidian Shrine EP is out. Um, and uh, Obs you know, Obsidian Shrine, I got my tongue tied there a little bit. Obsidian Shrine, you guys will remember from uh, last year, uh, I played a track by them that was on the Consortium in Diaboli split EP that they did with another band called Salt. Really, really cool uh, blackened death metal, um, you know, with uh, uh, rather than a French twist, an American twist. Dereliction of Divinity is very interesting because it's actually, um, sound-wise, it's a stripping back from uh, the, the, the music that was on that EP. You know, it sounds more raw. It's a bit more in your face as a result. It sounds, it's got a bit more of an organic production. Um, and I would also go as far as to say, musically and riff-wise, um, I think the Euro European influences, for as much as these guys are, are from the US, the European influences have been dialed up a little bit. But um, whatever they have done works extraordinarily well for them because not only is this a big, big step up from already good music they laid down on that EP um, but this is something that you know I am flummoxed as to why it's not signed I mean the the uh, EP is being put out independently um, all six tracks as you will hear is just absolutely fucking sensational bludgeoning nasty supremely memorable um, and uh, they certainly from my perspective deserve way more attention than they're getting so that's why we're going to change that on into the necrosphere right now and i'm going to play you one of my favorite tracks off the ep dereliction of divinity this is a song called evil has its day
You just listened to Evil Has Its Day by Obsidian Shrine off their brand new EP, Dereliction of Divinity. It's available on Bandcamp right now. Head over there, check it out. Make sure you check out that Necro Wretch album as well. Uh, and uh, like I said last week, uh, whilst 2023, it turned out to be a fantastic year when it came to heavy music, but it was a bit, a bit, bit sluggish in getting started. Uh, there has been no delay, no sluggishness whatsoever with 2024, uh, and the year is off to an absolutely flying start. And uh, we're going to find out on the news rant right now uh, what else might be in the pipeline. But first, I need to introduce the news rant properly. If you're a simp, it's time for you to hit the bricks, because this is my weekly news rant. A roundabout for judgment. And hang them where the world can see. All right, Legion, uh, before I start this week's news rant, uh, I did promise you at the top of the show I had a couple of announcements or some news, some updates on the podcast to share with you. Uh, the first and probably biggest one, the most exciting one, is that I am going to be at Inferno Festival in Oslo, Norway this year. Uh, it takes place on the 28th to the 31st of March. I'll be there with my fellow horseman of the podcasting apocalypse, Cheyenne of Trivax. Um, he mentioned it on his last last episode of uh, Iblis Manifestations, uh, he also suggested that Iblis Manifestations will be part of the festival in some way. I can confirm that is the case for Into the Necrosphere as well. Uh, I can't share the details of what our involvement will be just yet, um, but it is really exciting. Um, and I think as far as exposing the podcast to maybe a wider audience, uh, I think it's a, I mean, just an incredible opportunity. And uh, again, I'll share more about how it came about. Uh, etc etc nearer the time uh, as you can see as well uh, the lineup is pretty spicy so you've got Dimo Borger you've got Toka you've got uh, Gorgoroth Kampfar Candle Mass Borknagar Solstafir Fintroll Me and That Man Carpathian Forest Cynic Cattle Decapitation Norjevil uh, Orbit Culture and a bunch of others um, it clearly presents a fantastic opportunity that I will take ample advantage of to uh, record a couple of in-person episodes of Into the Necro Sphere. A few names uh, immediately jump out at me on that lineup uh, as to, uh, you know, bands or maybe individuals that I'd like to get on the show. But uh, you guys let me know in the comments or drop me a line on Instagram or Facebook. Tell me who you'd like me to uh, to get on the podcast from that lineup. Um, naturally, I can't guarantee that uh, I'll be able to do every single one, but uh, I'll certainly try my best. But yeah, really excited about it and obviously if you are going to be in Norway uh, at that time or if you are going to be at uh, Inferno you know and you see me I'd love to say hello so uh, come up say 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 what's happening um, and then uh, yeah maybe we can uh, have a couple of them uh, Norwegian beers um, another festival that I will be present at this year Fortress Fest I did mention this last year but their lineup has started to uh, evolve as well, and it's starting to get really exciting. Uh, this is going to be taking place, uh, I think it's the first weekend of June, in Scarborough here in the UK. Um, included in the lineup are Der Weg Einer Freiheit, uh, Fleisterars, uh, Mistirming, Dotsret, Wolves in the Throne Room, uh, Geria, Mortiferum, uh, Blood Countess, Triptychon, uh, Ulther, so uh, my man Ralph will be there again. Hopefully we get to do another episode. Uh, Thy Light, Black Braid, Panopticon, uh, Furia, Abyssal, and uh, Lamp of Murmur. Now again, let me know who you are most keen on me getting on the show. Uh, I will try my best to make most of them happen. Uh, I will preempt any requests for uh, Tom Warrior of uh, of Crypticon with um, let's 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 just. Let's just call a spade a spade here. I'm not sure he and I are going to have the, the the biggest amount in common. I have met the guy, I interviewed him for Chronicles of Chaos, and it was actually a very pleasant conversation. But yeah, I think um, I, 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 I'm not sure about that one. Let me just put it that way. I'm going to be pragmatic and say that one might not make the most amount of sense. So, But that being said, again, I'll be in Scarborough for Fortress Fest. Hope to see uh, you know a fair few of you there. And uh, you know if there are bands in particular that you want me to focus on trying to get, I'm gonna, I'll try and manage my schedule around that. Um, another update uh, that I think has potential to be very exciting. Um, I have been collaborating with uh, some folks uh, from Norway on um, a project that they're launching on YouTube called 
the metal channel, um, you are going to start to see the uh, Into the Necrosphere weekly news rant appearing on uh, the metal channel. It will still be part of Into the Necrosphere, the actual podcast. So the format of my show will absolutely not change. What you see on YouTube and Spotify and everything else will stay exactly as is. You guys will recall last year, I was talking a bit about why I think I put a a poll out on the socials about whether you guys would like to see the two split off into two separate episodes and and overwhelmingly everyone seemed to enjoy the long format even though it uh, it means some episodes you know tend to go past the four hour mark you know which is uh, which is quite a bit but anyway um, but that being said uh, you know the metal channel I think is uh, is a great idea Uh, this is a this is something that I can do to support them and again equally it's a means to you know potentially expose into the necrosphere to to, uh, you know, a couple of more um, aspirant members of the Legion. And the bigger the Legion gets, the easier it is for us to, you know, have opportunities like uh, Inferno uh, pushed our way. So, uh, yeah, I told you 2024 was going to be super exciting. Um, There's a couple more things that are in the pipeline that uh, I'm not going to talk about just yet. One final thing that I will say is not necessarily... Maybe metal folk, well, actually not metal focused at all, if we're perfectly, uh, if we're perfectly fair. Uh, but I will be at the Munich High End Hi Fi Show. That's the plan right now. Um, I am potentially going to try. There's one particular gentleman from, uh, you know, if anybody has followed my my, uh, you know, comments, conversations about Hi Fi. My favorite hi-fi brand, uh, Griffin Audio. There's a gentleman who works for them, um, and I'm gonna I'm gonna pitch the idea of doing an episode uh, with him uh, because again, we'll have the opportunity to do something face to face. I've met him quite a few times before. You know, he's a he's just an incredibly interesting guy. Great in, great personal story, um, and uh, I know that there are a fair few of you guys that are interested in the uh, in the hi-fi game. I mean, we'll we'll obviously uh, make it le- more about him and less about you know the technical nerdy stuff. Um, and then obviously I know as well when uh, Attila was on the podcast, we spoke about him potentially joining me. Uh, I'm not, I'm not holding my breath for that to happen. Um, but uh, I mean the invitation is certainly there if he's keen on joining us. But uh, yeah, very excited about that. So if you're in Munich uh, around, I think this is the the eighth, ninth, and tenth of May. I'm, I might be wrong, but some it's somewhere around there. Then uh, yeah, great to see you well, again. We'll have uh, some of that Bavarian beer. Um, okay, so uh, we start on metalstorm.net as usual, the greatest uh, metal website in uh, all of the land. Uh, the first single is, oh, sorry, the first headline that we're checking out Despondency of Premiering Inherited Animosity single. Uh, it says here Inherited Animosity, the newest advanced single from Despondency's forthcoming studio album, uh, Matrophagy, has surfaced online. The record, which is planned for a mid-2024 release, was uh, recorded by Jorg Uken at Sound Lodge Studios, uh, as well as mixed and mastered by him at the very same studio. I have no idea what despondency sounds like, so uh, let's give this a whirl. I think if you have completely worn out your copy of or your copies of the new Suffocation and new Dying Fetus albums uh, and uh, you were sick and tired of listening to Broken Hopes old records and maybe the old Deeds of Flesh stuff, maybe you'd want to give Despondency a try. Um, but uh, if, if, if there's kind of a tiering list or at least a, a stack ranking of bands that I'm going to listen to before I listen to this band, uh, yeah, despondency. On, 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 they're, they're not going to fare very well as far as their their position nearer the top is concerned. Um, I was just having a gander on Metal Archives while this was playing. These guys are from Germany. Uh, they actually haven't been active for quite some time. Their first record, God on Acid, uh, came out in two thousand three and gets a pretty decent uh, review, average review, 
albeit across two reviews, is 91%. Uh, it then drops to 70% for Revelation 5, I think, or Revelation 4, Rise of the Nemesis. Uh, that came out in 2009. So, uh, yeah, not not been active for a while. Um, and with the greatest of respect, not sure the world has massively missed them. Again, it's not it's not horrible, but um, that style of, of death metal, it just needs... I, we've spoken about this in previous weeks with the standard of death metal being where it is right now creatively as far as the level of musicianship is concerned just you know every single thing about where the benchmark is set right now that just doesn't quite cut it um in 2003 i can definitely see that it would have it it, it, it you know it would have cut the mustard but not uh not in the year and now i don't think okay uh vincent crowley unleash amitable's horror single it says here vincent crowley presents amitable's horror the second preview track from upcoming sophomore record anthology of horror the latter drops later this month on february 3rd um and uh i don't th i don't think we actually heard the first single uh that might may have come out while i was on vacation so uh yeah let's hear what this one sounds like Now that, I mean, I'm going to ignore the lyrics because I feel like they're a little, I don't know if the phrase on the nose is, is correct to describe them, but they just don't, I, I don't like lyrics that are that kind of prescriptive, if you guys understand what I mean. I mean, I've always been a fan of lyrics that are, you know, maybe, you know, written in a, in a more kind of detached way, a way that, that seems more kind of vague and allows me to impose more of my my own thoughts and my own, um, you know, my own interpretation of it. But musically, that is fucking excellent. And of course, Vincent Crowley, um, you know, many of you guys will know from uh, his work in Acheron. I always thought Acheron was like, They've been a band that has these real peaks creatively uh, throughout their discography. Never, a, never maybe a single album. Like, uh, you know, if I think about stuff of theirs that I've listened to that I really, really liked, um, I thought that Rite of the or well, Rites of the Black Mass had its moments. Uh, I thought um, Rebirth, um, metamorphosing into Godhood was was you know actually was very very good um you know uh the last record that they did cult uh des Hasses, and i'm having to remind myself of the um of the names of these records just you know i, I know the years they came out but you know again i'm old so <laughs> i can't remember all those titles off my heart but yeah they had these they had these records that had moments on them that were just absolutely sensational but never like a record that was um that was perfect from you know start to finish that you just thought okay this was flawless and it was weird because they always had the ingredients for it one of the you know i think key weapons in their arsenal was vincent crowley's vocals uh you know he always was just a fucking phenomenal vocalist to me um you know and again many many of the other musicians in that band were top tier as well but i like i like musically where he's going with a single not sure what the rest of the record sounds like we, you know we may be in the midst of a repeating pattern here whereby you know the rest of the album is you know hit or miss but um especially those last kind of 30 seconds that dark little break that we've uh, that we've landed in uh, i am down with that without a shadow of a doubt Oh, God, 
Yeah, I stand by my initial uh, impression. First, I like musically, I think the song is great. I think Vincent's voice sounds good technically. I could just do without those lyrics. Uh, and that's a, a matter of personal preference. I just don't really like lyrics that are that that prescriptive, that on the nose. Um, you know, I, I like lyrics that are, you know, lit written um you know more abstractly um and and actually what i find as well when you have lyrics that are you know written like that that are kind of almost you can feel there's like a degree of almost for imposed structure on them in order for you to kind of arrive at whatever topic you're singing about or, or really clarify whatever topic you're singing about i i feel that kind of limits the flow to the vocals as well and you guys know my my thoughts on that i'm a very big fan of you know flow in somebody's voice like that to me is part of the magic of great extreme metal vocaling um you know if we think about good examples and you know there are many basically anything that Sam Bean does on Werewolves, um, you know, first two Deerside albums, you know, Repent to Die is a great, great example of that, that flow in Glenn's voice. Um, sadly, absent, in my view, from much of what he has done recently. But um, yeah, that's, that's kind of what I'm leaning towards. That's my preference, but not hating that. And I think if you are an, a, uh, an Acheron fan, you know, you, you're probably going to be down with uh, what Vincent Crowley is doing at the moment. All right. Um, Next up, we've got a track by The Halo Effect. Um, the, the name The Halo Effect, I don't really care for. And uh, I think The Halo Effect, if memory serves me correctly, is uh, something that the In Flames folk uh, or s someone from In Flames is doing, uh, which kind of gives you probably an idea of how much I don't give a shit about that band and anything that they get up to. But, um, you know, we're, uh, we're, we've clicked on the article, so I'm obligated to listen to it now. So it says here, the Halo Effect are back with a new song uh, called Become Surrender. The latter was written and recorded during the days of the Lost Sessions. The accompanying live video clip was recorded at their show in Gothenburg, Sweden. Michael Stan comments, uh, Become Surrender was written and recorded during the days of the Lost Sessions, but for some re uh, reason we left it out of the album. Uh, it has been something we've played during festivals and on our tours, and the response has been nothing short of fantastic, so we decided to release it in the interim before we start rolling out singles for the second album. The video was shot during our sold-out show, blah, blah, blah. Nothing, nothing particularly insightful to read there further, but uh, let's hear what the song sounds like. my verdict of that um yeah it'll find its audience uh, again that's probably the nicest thing i can say it'll definitely find its audience there's no you know no surprise that that show was sold out the audience probably won't consist of any of my associates 
any, 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 any of my bros, probably not any members of the Legion either. It's just, I've heard that kind of music a thousand times before. I don't care for that kind of clean singing. Um, I mean, I like clean singing, but just not that style, that really kind of polished style. Um, so uh, yeah, the Halo effect is a, is a must miss in my opinion. Uh, Origin premiere, a new standalone single. Now, speaking of must miss, as much of a fan as I am of Origin, that last record of theirs was without a doubt a must miss. And that's, you know, it, it's it saddened me to have to say that because I was such a huge fan of Antithesis, uh, Entity, Omnipresent. Um, I mean, records that a lot of people didn't even like, I was down with. Um, you know, Informus Infinitas, Inhumanitas, I remember that's the record that I got into them on, and it was partly because Eric Rutan was going on about how great they are, Echoes of Decimation, phenomenal. And then this Chaosmos came out, and I just thought it was, it just, it jumped the shark as far as technical death metal are concer is concerned. A lot of technical death metal bands do that. They are so insistent on telling you how well they can play their instruments that you end up with a situation where the technicality is kind of taken center stage and songwriting is a you know is an is an afterthought that was my takeaway from chaosmos and that's coming from somebody who really was looking forward to the record and and really wanted to like it uh i went back to it a couple of times thinking has I, have i missed something here there's a couple of folks i know that really like it but it just it was not it just wasn't cutting the mustard so um we now move to uh, their new single uh, in anticipation of the 40 years of the apocalypse north american tour with label mates vader origin is proud to offer fans the single disease called man originally written for their 2000 self-titled debut album uh, the single was re-recorded and is now available for the masses um, so that's probably that's 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 probably an interesting twist here we're going to listen to a song that's recently been recorded, but, you know, it was written 24 years ago. But anyways, so I'm going to, I'll, I'll read Paul Ryan's comments straight after this, but uh, let's give the song its first 60 seconds. Human beings are a disease, a cancer of this planet. You are a plague, and we are the cure. very very decisive thumbs up there um you know again no, no surprise it comes from an era of the band that i really liked the only thing that i don't enjoy is the is the opening pseudo sample i might be wrong and and it actually is a, there actually is a movie where that sample was taken from it doesn't sound like it to me uh it sounds like somebody might have been reading some dialogue from a movie you know maybe somebody in the band and you know they put it through various effects and stuff like that i i hate it when bands do that i absolutely hate it if you're gonna if you're gonna use a sample use the sample or don't use anything at all um i i can't stand when people do that it feels to me like it, it's like buying a fucking knockoff Hugo Boss t-shirt and running around and telling everybody it's real. Uh, it's just it's just not my thing. But musically, fucking excellent. And John uh, Longstreth, the drummer, holy God, the guy is good. I mean, just, just absolutely on a, you know... A, a very very elite tier which are which is occupied by very very few uh you know men and women in the scene or very few other men and women in the scene i should say but yeah like i said no surprise i like it um it says yeah our origins paul ryan comments uh we're excited to present a song that was written 25 years ago with our current lineup of origin uh in coordination with our upcoming tours in 2024 the doomsday clock ticks closer to the extinction of humanity um let's give it another 60 seconds
that is top notch there's there's and and as anybody who's anybody knows there is no greater compliment than calling something top notch save perhaps for referring to it as beyond top notch but uh, i love that absolutely love it everything works the song is great there's technicality but there's there's very much still you know something memorable something for me to get my 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 teeth sunk into every single man in the band you know just sounds in absolutely top form uh jason kaiser sounds fucking brilliant um you know as the vocalist i mentioned uh john longstreth actually on the topic of uh john longstreth i finally watched the 2014 film uh whiplash on this past week's episode of Necromaniacs, uh, Professor Jeff Kashid mentioned that he had uh, revisited it, uh, referred to it as one of the finest films in, of the last 23 years, um, you know, which I thought was quite an interesting, you know, quite precise number. Um, but um, yeah, I, you know, it, it reminded me that I needed to, you know, finally get my act together and, and, and actually watch it. And holy Jesus, just unreal. I mean, J.K. Simmons, certainly uh you know deserves every single piece of uh silverware or uh you know gold statue that he has received in um uh, you know in in recognition of his performance in that film but just everything about it is great and as a side note what what is tremendous we were talking about hi-fi earlier um the way that movie sounded on my setup over here was just fucking phenomenal i'm not even a particularly big fan of jazz but even i was like digging digging what i was hearing so if you haven't watched whiplash yet make sure you do and another thing i can recommend you uh, check out the arnold schwarzenegger um documentary on netflix i've only watched the first episode so far which focuses on his time as an athlete and competing in mr universe and in mr olympia but uh fantastic you'll see the man through very very different eyes uh once you have um you know once you've taken an opportunity to watch that and i'm, I'm looking forward to checking out the rest okay um i know that i'll definitely uh mispronounce this band's name but uh what the fuck we're gonna go ahead and do it anyway um humfert or hum i, th I think it's humfert let's stick with that <laughs> Releasing third studio album next month on March the 22nd, 2024, Faroe Islands based Death Doom outfit Humfert uh, will put their new studio record dubbed uh, Men Goods Hunt er Stark um, as a precursor to the release of the new music effort. The band today deliver a video for their first single and opening track, A Beer. Um, again, I'm sure I have heard these guys, and I'm sure we we may even have spoken about them on the uh, on the news rant. But it doesn't immediately come to mind whether or not they, you know, whether they passed the test, whether they whether they were able to uh, stand tall before the throne of judgment, and uh, you know, uh, live to tell the tale. So let's hear what it sounds like. wintry sounds for fucking cold ass uh at least northern hemisphere and these guys obviously if you know you know anything about geography faroe islands is quite close to uh iceland and norway these guys definitely pull on i would say particularly their icelandic uh, influences and you know that scene is just second to none um you know then we 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 need not even expand on norway but i mean I, you know I, the icelandic 
black metal scene is fucking phenomenal they've got some great death metal bands from there as well this this band kind of throws a couple of different uh ideas at the wall and every single one of them sticks as far as i'm concerned great vocals great um you know great riffs great melody um i I love the production as well you know really beefy you know really kind of just smacks you in the face so uh yeah love it love what i am hearing so far it says here the narrative concept behind uh men guts hund erstark is inspired by a harrowing local event the 1915 whaling disaster of the faroe island village of sandvik uh, home of hamfert bassist asmar jonsson when 14 men died driving whales ashore in the stormy bay the village population witnessed the tragedy from the seaside i can't remember where i saw it but there's a documentary that i saw where they showed fuck it actually might be sunny sun's best you best uh uh i think the like best food show ever or something like that he's got a very you guys will know which one i'm talking about very cool youtube channel um and they were showing some country that um basically chases whales ashore and they 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 live off those whales they eat them they eat the, the meat and i think they use the fat and stuff the oil for various products as well but um yeah it's uh you know interesting interesting concept more interesting to me is the music uh the music so far is is very decidedly getting the second top notch of the news round so far Love it. And I think that's a great a great example of where clean vocals are used properly. That sounds fucking cool. Halo effect sounded like absolute shite. But uh, I am super excited about hearing the rest of this record. Top notch, without a shadow of a doubt. For those watching this on YouTube and wondering, yes, I just took a swig of Prime. <laughs> I, I think that Logan Paul and all of his mates are fucking absolute cunts. But uh, the uh, I, I do like me the taste of Prime. I, I, can't, I can't help it um it's uh something that i picked up while i was on holiday uh maybe i keep drinking it because it reminds me of being on holiday but um yeah it's uh it, you know I'm, I'm 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 partial to a bit of it i did think the south park episode um where they were talking about prime they called it cred and uh logan paul's character was uh or the logan paul type character was logan Ledouche. i think that might be one of the fucking funniest things that that show has ever done i mean it just complete and utter genius so if you haven't seen that yet make sure that you check it out um all right the next headline far sought present descent song and lyric video uh really really like that first single the second one came out while uh, i was on vacation so uh we have that one to skip but it says here german avant-garde black metal group far sought revealed descent the third and final advanced single from their forthcoming new album life promised death which comes out on february the 16th um i've been waiting for a new far Side record for a long time now so uh super excited to hear what this one sounds like
does this happen? Right, I'm going to just pause there for a second. So, yeah, this is quite different to uh, the first single we heard. I think the first single we heard was for uh, Nausea. The, so this, the song was called Nausea. Um, some folks possibly not familiar with Forest Hut might say that the song induces, the one we just listened to, in, is inducing nausea. But uh, I, I, I am willing to withhold judgment because the song, I'm just having a quick gander on Metal Archive now, it's towards the end of the record. So I think it might be one of those tracks that really kind of makes sense in the you know, in the scheme, the grand scheme of the record overall. Um, and we will skip to the middle of it because it's also eight minutes, uh, eight, eight minutes 30. So it's a fairly lengthy track. Uh, let's hear where the song goes to. Um, and again, I will urge anybody who has not listened to the previous uh, Farsad record, Fail Lure, that came out back in 2017, really do yourself a favor and listen to that because it's fucking stunning. And another plus for me on this, I, by the way, don't actually mind what I just heard now. The, the, the spoken word, but I'm not so sure about which is. I'm probably, I'm just going to do the band and myself a favor and skip that. You guys know my thoughts on spoken word. I mean, it's one in 50 that actually maybe, maybe work. But um, one thing that I've always really appreciated about Farsad, it was true of failure definitely true of this uh or at least the first one minute 30 that we've listened to so far really really great sound the actual sound itself is f absolutely fantastic i don't know where they get these records recorded but um yeah more bands should be availing themselves of that producer that engineer and that studio but let's jump to uh the f about the halfway mark of the song um and let's hear if uh, business is picked up as they say Yeah, I'm not gonna write. I'm not ready to write this off yet. I I do think this is gonna make sense, uh, you know, in the in the context of the rest of the record. I quite liked that post punk, uh, gothy, like new wave little um, influence that I heard in the distorted guitar riff right at the very beginning when we uh, when we kind of fast forwarded to that segment of the song. Um, but uh, my 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 overall takeaway remains. I, I think it's brave maybe a little just a just a smidgen misguided to put that out as your as as a as a single for the record because i i suspect that if you're if you're looking to attract a certain a certain audience or at least get you know a certain audience energized about your new record then um maybe the more um the more challenging listens on the record i would wait i would leave for when they actually hear the album and they can listen to the album uh, in full. I might be wrong on that. You guys let me know what you think, but that's that that would be my my view. All right, uh, Job for a Cowboy have revealed a video for Beyond the Chemical Doorway track. It says here, yeah, Job for a Cowboy are premiering an official video for Beyond the Chemical Doorway, the new single from their long-awaited forthcoming long player, Moon Healer, uh, set for release on February 23rd via Metal Blade Records. That's just around the corner. So very excited to, uh, to actually hear the whole thing. The release marks the iconic outfit's first full-length in a decade. Um, the first track we've heard off of this has been sensational. Great, obviously, that they're back. Sun Eater that came out prior to Moon Healer, I still think is one of the most criminally underrated uh, extreme metal albums by a certain subsection of the metal scene. And, you know, we know why they disliked them. One, hated the name. Two, um, you know, because Job for a Cowboy came from the deathcore scene, I think there was always, and actually the, the, the MySpace scene, there was just always going to be that kind of um, reflexive prejudice against whatever they did. But that being said, those that have given them the time over the years will realize they're a great band. And I, I think this new record um, is hopefully 
going to uh you know find the the, the naysayers uh eating their words but I, I may also be completely wrong i've not heard the single yet let's hear what it sounds like Once again, uh, Nick, and I, and I, and I, I apologize to him if he ever hears this. I know I'm going to butcher his surname. Uh, Shkenzilos, uh, the bassist, he used to play for Cephalic Carnage. I've said this before, I've told the story before. I remember seeing Cephalic Carnage play live and watching, just being completely fixed on him for the whole show. He was so fucking good and he added so much to that band on stage. He does exactly the same for Job for, the, for a Cowboy and does exactly the same for this song. On these uh, Focal cans that I'm listening to uh, it, it on, it just comes out so, so, so clearly. Uh, and then everything else is just working. Great riff. Johnny Davy sounds fucking fantastic in the, the, the vocal booth. Um, yeah, I, the, the more I hear music off this record, the more excited I'm getting. Um, you know, it's obviously not as uh, abrasive as Vitriol, but another record I can certainly see, you know, getting you know get, getting a fair bit of fanfare when it uh, when it finally drops uh it's aggressive it's immersive um you know it's it's an, it's technical without again without sacrificing you know the actual song and and without sacrificing uh memorability uh it, it's just a great from what i'm hearing so far it's a great progression from sun eater so if you like sun eater i think you, you i think you're going to be you know, happy as uh, a pig and shit hearing what uh, you've heard on Beyond the Chemical Doorway so far. Johnny Davy also knows his way around a good voice noise, so any any well timed is immediately immediately earns you a top notch. Um, you know, you, you you'd have to be writing pretty shit music to not earn a top notch if, as long as you know how to time that perfectly. And of course, the, the band whose T-shirt that I'm wearing right now, Drew Goth, uh, that last Drew Goth record um, is absolutely littered with those moments. Um, there has been a lot of uh, talk about how great that uh, that record is on the last couple of episodes where we spoke about the top um, 30 of 2023. Friends, if you haven't listened to it yet, again, I, I cannot stress um, enough that it is essential listening. Battles may cease, but war is forever. You must, must have that in your rotation if it's not been before. You will thank me, trust me. Uh, okay, Midnight have put out a new uh, record called Hellish, called, or will put out a new record, I should say, called Hellish Expectations. 
It says here, Ohio-based Midnight will unleash its sixth full-length offering, Hellish Expectations, on March the 8th via Metal Blade Records. Uh, in advance of the unofficial, or sorry, the official unveiling of Hellish Expectations, Midnight have dropped the record's first single, album closer uh, F-O-A-L, aka Fuck Off and Live, uh, alongside an accompanying video. I don't like the sentiments expressed uh, by the latter part of that song title, <laughs> but uh, let's hear what it sounds like. That's pretty cool. Uh, I like the riff. I like the, the vibe of the song. No, no question about it. It would have sounded better. As much as it would have been trite to do it, it would have sounded better if he said fuck off and die rather than fuck off and live. Just my, just, just my take on that. But yeah, I mean, Mid Midnight has been a band that a lot of folks have tried to, um, you know, talk about in, in very glowing terms, in terms like, you know, the future of extreme music, blah, 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 or the next big thing. Uh, I, I've never really thought of them as the next big thing, but um, I'm, you know, I don't, I've never heard a midnight track and gone, God, that's fucking terrible. You know, play that near me and uh, yeah, I'm going to, I'm going to throw down. Okay, uh, Dark Space uh, have got a new single out. Um, I was really surprised and, and uh, you know, very pleased when I saw the season of Mr. signed Dark Space. They've been a band I've kind of kept tabs on for a while. And they've always put out really interesting stuff. Um, so, you know, it's been cool to see that they finally are being recognized and put on a bigger platform. It says here today, the Outer Space Trio Dark Space are presenting their third and final audio extract from their upcoming release, Dark Space 2, these next few minutes will be the last presented to Earthlings across the globe before the entire 47-minute project is unleashed on February the 16th through Season of Mist. February 16th seems to be the next January the 26th, so a lot of exciting stuff coming out then. Uh, let's hear what the new Dark Space sounds like. feel like there's I, I like the vibe I like the I, I, I broadly speaking I think the I think the melody the riff the atmosphere is very cool I think maybe 90 seconds worth of it without any real meaningful change or meaningful progression I, I think I, I think that's maybe laboring the point a little more than it needs to be if you guys if you if you can feel me knocking 
Um, and as, as I said, I mean, they, they actually, in fairness, if you know Dark Space's music, they tend to have a habit of doing this in any case. And sometimes it's one of those things where if you listen to the whole record, you know, it almost becomes quite hypnotic, you know, that, re that repetition. And it does work for them. So um, I'm going to just jump ahead by a minute. So we're at the 2 minute 30 mark. Uh, and let's hear if, uh, if things have picked up. Apparently not. Um, so, yeah, that one earns a uh, it earns a fair to middling. It doesn't earn a thumb thumb. Maybe not a thumbs up. It earns a eh, a, a, a slight flex of the hand. Um, but like I said, I, I I really do like their their other music. Um, I am glad they're on Season of Mist. I'm still looking forward to hearing what the rest of the record sounds like. So we'll uh, we'll, we'll we'll you know save our. I'll save my uh, either wrath or acclaim once uh, or for the full, you know, for the full album when it gets released. Okay, we're going to wrap up on uh, the Democrats Guide to Rock Music, Blabbermouth as uh, as usual. Um, obviously, normally this is uh, really only just to poke fun or just to talk about some random bullshit that, uh, that might come up here. Um, so the first headline that I see here is why Richie Sambora didn't attend John Bon Jovi's Music Hairs Person of the Year ceremony. Richie Sambora is starting to look an awful lot like uh, Mickey Rourke, in my opinion, um, like Mickey Rourke on, on, on The Wrestler in particular. Um, and as much as I'm not a fan of Bon Jovi, I have to say this. Uh, if you go on to YouTube and you type in Richie Sambora Bad Company, um, there's a an acoustic version of the song that he does live um, that serves as a lead-in into Wanted Dead or Alive. I don't give a shit how much you fucking hate anything Bon Jovi does. I don't care how much you hate Richie Sambora, but that particular song, that particular moment, oh my God, fucking incredible. Um, so, uh, yeah. Uh, David Vincent on Morbid Angel's early days. There was nothing that sounded like what we were doing. Um, I mentioned, obviously, Inferno earlier, and David Vincent will be there with Ultimas. That would be a, that would be a pretty, pretty sweet interview to do, I think. Um, we actually tried to get something like that hooked up, like, way, way back in the early days of the podcast. Um, and I had been put in touch with his manager. Manager said, you know, I'll get back to you. Um, and then, yeah, nothing happened, which was, uh, which was disappointing. But, you know, in, in, in those heady days, uh, the podcast was probably only getting about five, maybe 600 downloads per episode. So those are the, the, the times are different now. Anyway, it says here, in a new interview with uh, Jonathan Smith of Sonic Perspectives, former Morbid Angel and current I Am Morbid frontman David Vincent was asked about the early years of his development as a death metal singer and whether he took any influence from other Florida death metal vocalists like John Tardy and Glenn Benton. He responded as follows, Well, I believe I was before them, uh, but that's neither here nor there. In the early days of Morbid Angel, we pretty much just isolated ourselves and we did what we did. Uh, we weren't really necessarily trying to copy anyone because there wasn't anything to copy. There was nothing that sounded like what we were doing. We just sort of blazed our own trail and thankfully and fortunately it translated and became a thing. But again, uh, there were a lot fewer bands back then. So the fact that the bands that were out there, everyone was unique, sort of in their own style, uh, which is not really the case from my ears, uh, that what's happening today. There's a lot today that sounds very, very similar. Um, I mean, I think he's right about today. There, there are just all, a lot more bands and a, a lot of bands kind of dabble in the same style. The one thing that, that I think is maybe why a lot of people are so fixated on and so stuck on the past is because of the fact that there were so few bands, but all those bands sounded very, very distinct. And, um, you know, David, just as a vocalist, um, was to me when I was a, a young blood, I mean, my absolute hero. Uh, I remember hearing... Um, well, my, my first encounter with Morbid Angel was God of Emptiness on uh, Beavis and Butthead. <laughs> and whilst they were mocking it, I was listening to what's going on in the background and I'm going, holy shit, this is fucking incredible. 
um, you know, not only does this guy have just in, insane, just an insane growl, and it, that you know, a growl that to my mind is way more brutal and convincing and aggressive than anything I had heard up to that point, and no disrespect to them, but that had included Cannibal Corpse. You know, I'd, I'd had the bleeding by that point. Obituary, Bolt Thrower, great bands, great albums, but there was just something about David that just sounded so convincing. And then he, he belts out those clean vocals as well, which obviously wasn't something he did frequently, but when he did it on God of Emptiness, it was just so fucking haunting and just so commanding. I, I just absolutely loved it. So, uh, yeah, I mean, I... Whether he was first or, or uh, you know, whether the other guys were first, I mean, I, who knows? Who gives a fuck? It, it doesn't really matter. But, yeah, David, to me, as a as a vocalist and just as a front man, I just loved his whole vibe. Uh, you know, he had this this air of discipline <laughs> that just no one else had. Like, you know, he was very eloquent, very well-spoken. I remember, you know, that, um, that conversation that he had with uh, Vanessa Warwick for uh, Headbangers Ball. And... You know, she asked the same stupid fucking inane questions that, that she asked of everybody, but, you know, he just had a way of of responding to her that I, I just felt just carried that much more weight, that more, much more authority. And, you know, 14, 15-year-old me was watching that, and, and that dude was just my euro. So, um, yeah, uh, it, it's, 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 you know, just... I. As he was, as I was reading that interview, my mind was just going back to uh, to those those heady days. But I mean, as far as as um, you know, maybe the first four, yeah, maybe first first three to four Morbid Angel records. I mean, there's very very few guys that, or very few vocal performances, in my opinion, that come close to David Vincent. Um, I thought that all was lost actually when he left after Domination, and then obviously Steve Tucker came in and did vocals on my favorite ever Morbid Angel record, which is Formula's Fatal to the Flesh. But um, if I could uh, if I could have a chat with a man, it would be fucking awesome. But uh, again, you know, who knows? Uh, I'll, I'm, I'm not going to I'm not going to confirm absolutely anything until it is uh, signed, sealed and in the books. And the reason for that is I should have learned my lesson uh, last year and the years previously. I said to you guys, I've got uh, Carl Rasmussen of Vitriol coming on the podcast, had the interview booked for this past Wednesday and it did not happen now i don't know what happened in the background i'm sure something came up and you know maybe the dude had some sort of personal thing that he needed to look into work wise band wise who knows um but the fact of the matter is um it, it didn't take place uh i'm looking to see whether it can be rescheduled but this part of me as well that i i, I checked out the episode that he did on iblis manifestations and uh I mean, honestly, I'm, I say this from a place of intense humility. That's such a good uh, interview that Cheyenne did with him. I, I almost don't know whether it's 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 worth getting him on at this point. You know, maybe I leave it for like six months or a year or something and get him on later when maybe there's something different to say. Like, I, I feel like Cheyenne nailed that, that episode so well. And if you haven't checked out that episode yet, make sure you do. I think he just nailed that episode so well. I, I don't necessarily feel like I can bring a lot more to the to the table, um, and that's not conceding defeat or anything like that. That's just you know that's just assessing the situation uh, in a sober and humble fashion. Um, you know, I think there's some. I'll, I'll look at some conversations that, that that my fellow podcasters have, and I'll go, okay, I, I I will come at this from a different angle, and what I get out of the person will be different. And then others, you you look at and you go. Oh, well, this is just so fucking good. Well, what's what's the point of having another one of these? Um, you know, when I when I don't think at this stage I can deliver anything that that goes anywhere beyond this in terms of depth and in terms of of subject matter. You know, anything that might be fresh and new and uh, and engaging. I am kind of rambling and ranting a little bit now, but it's it's called the news rant for a reason. So I'm going to finish off on this particular uh, headline. Philip and Selmo, these Pantera shows have lit and ignited a fuse and a fire in me. We'll read the context of this in just a second, but in my instant thought when I saw that headline was, don't be surprised if a new Pantera album gets announced in 2024 or 2025. And as much as I've been in favor of uh, the, the tours, because I get, the, I get where they're coming from, 
I absolutely would not be keen on a new Pantera album. So, uh, and there's there's reasons for that. We'll get into in a second. But yeah, I might be completely wrong. We'll read the the, the article, but just 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 looking at that at that headline, I'm immediately starting to to think when how long will it be before we are told new Pantera album first in 30 years or however long. And that just wouldn't be right. A Pantera album without Vinny and Dime, I can get the, I can buy a tour without them, but I cannot under any circumstances accept a Pantera record. I don't give a, a Pantera song without their involvement. So it says, yeah, Pantera has released a new video message from singer Philip Anselmo shot during the rehearsals for the band's February 2024 North American tour. In the short clip, which can be seen below, Anselmo states youngsters have come out in droves to see these Pantera shows and it has lit and ignited a fuse and fire in me. And I just want to play these fucking shows the best fucking way we goddamn know how. And I'm looking forward to it. Uh, last fall, Anselmo made his first public comments about Pantera's return to the live stage, blah, blah, blah. Um, Anselmo and Brown spoke about Pantera's return to the stage during an appearance on the 17th episode of the Metallica Report, the recently launched podcast offering weekly insider updates on all things Metallica. Phil said, it's empowering, it's incredibly beautiful, and you feel so much in love when you're up there uh, and you take it in. It's a great feeling, man, these days. Uh, that's where me and Rex, uh, we get to dig the shows more. He also, he also loves him some of that money, though. I mean, again, I, I'm all for people making money, and I'm... <laughs> I don't think it'll go over well if you're if you're in an interview like this and you go, hey, you know what I really like about these Pantera shows, the fucking payday. <laughs> but <clears throat> excuse me, but yeah, I mean, he 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 does like him some of that money. There's no doubt about that. Um. Uh, it says here, full continued, when we were younger, we were at war, uh, and when we were on stage, we were just angry and at war, man. Now it's, the songs are there, I can concentrate on singing the freaking songs, number one. Jeez, that's a relief for me, man. I don't have to break my freaking body in part anymore. Blah. It doesn't mention anything about the album, but, but like I said, and as soon as I saw that, as soon as I saw that comment, that's the first thing I thought of, and I, and I, I still hold to what I'm saying. I, I think there's a very good chance at some point in the next maybe 18 months we're gonna yeah there's a new pantera album in the works um and uh i, th I think they're gonna find the 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 soil of acceptance from the pantera fans a lot less welcoming if they did go down that route than um than they have done for these tours on that note my friends uh, i am wrapping up the news rant for this week that wraps up episode 211 of Into the Necrosphere. I will be back next week, a guest to be announced. I've got a couple of things in uh, the pipeline for this coming week. Uh, rest assured, I will never again make the same mistake as I did with uh, Kyle and Vitriol of announcing an episode before it is not absolutely signed, sealed, and in the bank. But uh, I do have a couple of things that uh, are booked for, uh, for the next couple of days. So uh, I'll have something cool whether it's me fucking talking to myself for an hour and a half uh, or uh, ideally somebody from a decent band that we all listen to. Um, in the meantime, my friends, we're going to finish off on a classic note this week, Pain Divine by Morbid Angel. We were talking about David Vincent in the news rant, so seems fitting to do so. Uh, that, of course, is off the classic album Covenant. Uh, whatever it is that you're doing and wherever it is that you are, stay safe, stay healthy, and I'll see you bad motherfuckers again next week. No!
Dead.